Okay, so I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about goalie gummies. Now, we all know that apple cider vinegar is the new health kick right now, okay? So you're supposed to take a shot or two in the morning. Some people take it three times a day. And you're supposed to get a lot of health benefits, such as losing weight, appetite control, etc., if you guys have ever taken apple cider vinegar shots, it is <laughs> a very strong taste, okay? It's a very strong taste. It burns your throat when it goes down just the whole nine. I used to take apple cider vinegar shots as well, and I just got sick of the taste. So I tried to find an alternative to it where I wouldn't lose the benefits, but the taste would be a little bit better. That's when I found out about goalie gummies. Now, goalie gummies, they are little gummies that has apple cider vinegar in it. And you get all of the same benefits of an apple cider vinegar shot. So the appetite control, um, the weight loss, etc. It's really tasty. So you don't have that burning sensation that's going down your throat every time you consume it. It's amazing. It comes in nice little packaging. They also have, um, you can also get an, an individual bottle if you want to try it, or you could do the one month supply, three month supply, or even a five month supply of these gummies. I take them every day and I love them. I try not to eat them as candy because they're just that good. If you want to take advantage of these gummies, I do have a special promo code for my listeners. You can go to go.goalie.com backslash C Fuller to get an additional 5% off your purchase. And there is nothing wrong with additional savings. I will take whatever I can get. So if you want to take advantage of these gummies, go to go.goalie.com backslash C Fuller to get additional savings. Hey y'all, my name is Christian. I'm a millennial and this is the Millennial Mind. Millennials get a bad rap for being lazy, non-productive members of society. They are also told that their opinions are warped and that they don't matter. This podcast is designed to express an opinion, but from a millennial's perspective. We will talk about everything from love and relationships to pop culture to pretty much everything that comes to mind. Come join me on this journey of speaking my mind And I hope that all of you are speaking your mind as well. Hey, y'all. Welcome to another episode of The Millennial Mind. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey of speaking my mind. And I hope that all of you are speaking your mind as well. Okay, I am a little bit sad Just to let you guys know, I am a little bit sad because this is the last episode of our Black History series on Unsung Heroes. I hope that you guys have have learned something from this series. I know I have. I've learned a lot about people that really haven't received the recognition that they deserved, and I hope I've shed a proper spotlight on those individuals. Now, I want to get right into this episode. I know that last week I actually forgot to do some interesting facts about a well-known hero in Black history. So what we're going to do is this last episode, we're going to do um, interesting facts about two well-known members of Black history, and then we will get into our unsung heroes. So the first one is going to be one that we should all know, and that is Martin Luther King Jr. So if you do not know, Martin Luther King Jr. was a pivotal activist during the civil rights movement and helped um, to get a huge leeway 
in integration policies. His life was cut short in, 19, in 1968 when he was assassinated at the age of 39. So just, just to give you a little bit of background on who he was. Um, I know his wife, the late Coretta Scott King, she was also involved and his children um, are also involved. I believe he had four children and two of them are living right now, I believe. I believe I got that right. Or maybe three. There, there's probably three living um, right now. So let's get into some interesting facts about Martin Luther King. Facts that you may not know. So here's the first one. His birth name was Michael, not Martin. hey -o. Okay. So he was born Michael King Jr. on January 15th, 1929. In 1934, however, his his father, a pastor at Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church, traveled to Germany and became inspired by the Protestant Reformation leader Martin Luther. As a result, King Sr. changed his own name as well as that of his five-year-old son. Interesting. So... You know, at first you're known by Michael, and then all of a sudden your daddy's like, nope, you're going to be, your your name is Martin. <laughs> it's just, it's just interesting. I, I wonder um, how little Martin felt at the time, like, okay, daddy, I guess. <laughs> okay, next interesting fact, King entered college at the age of 15. So he was such a gifted student that he skipped grades 9 and 12 before enrolling in 1944 at Morehouse College, the alma mater of his father and maternal grandfather. Although he was the son, grandson, and great-grandson of Baptist ministers, King did not intend to follow the family vocation until Morehouse President Benjamin E. Mays, a noted theologian, convinced him otherwise. King was ordained before graduating college with a degree in sociology. Here's another one. King received his doctorate in systematic theology. After earning a divinity degree from Pennsylvania's Crozer Theological Seminary, King attended graduate school at Boston University, where he received his PhD degree in 1955. The title of his dissertation was A Comparison of the Conceptions of God in the Thinking of Paul Tillich and Henry Nelson Wyman. Okay, here's another fact. King was imprisoned nearly 30 times. According to the King Center, the civil rights leader went to jail 29 times. He was arrested for acts of civil disobedience and, and on and on trumped up charges, such as when he was jailed in Montgomery, Alabama in 1956 for driving 30 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone. Now we know the rule of thumb, at least in the United States, is that is that you get five miles per hour over or under. Come on now. So they 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 were just really trying to get him just just ruin his spirits. Okay. Let's do one more fact. So here's a good one. King narrowly escaped an assassination attempt a decade before his death. On September 20th, 1958, King was in Harlem signing copies of his new book, Stride Toward Freedom, in Bloomstein's department store, where he was approached by Isola Ware Curry. The woman asked if he was Martin Luther King Jr., after he said yes, Curry said, I've been looking for you for five years. And she plunged a seven-inch letter opener into his chest. The tip of the blade came to rest alongside his aorta, and King underwent hours of delicate emergency surgery. Surgeons later told King that just one sneeze could have punctured the, the aorta and killed him. From his hospital bed, where he convalesced for weeks, King issued a statement affirming his nonviolent principles and saying he felt no ill will toward his mentally ill attacker. And that's something I did not know. That somebody plunged a mail opener into his chest 
And then she said she she was looking for him for five years. Good Lord, come on now. But that just showed that God wanted him to be here for um, those last 10 years because he did not die. It almost um, went into his aorta, but it was, um, they say it rested alongside his aorta. So that just shows that God had a purpose for him, which he did fulfill. So there we go. There are some interesting facts about Martin Luther King. Now, another person, another well-known person that I wanted to do some interesting facts about, and I know my good friend Renee B. Renee will love to hear this because this is her idol, but we are going to do some interesting facts about Oprah Winfrey, okay? So if you don't know who Oprah Winfrey is, Oprah Winfrey is... She's a billionaire, first of all. She's a talk. Sh- she was a talk show host. She's a producer, director, actress, all of it. Um, she really made some pivotal steps in entertainment. She's just an all-around incredible woman, and that is that. That's the nice way of me putting it, or in layman layman's terms of me putting it, but. Everybody's dream is to meet Oprah because Oprah's just at the top of the list. I think she's higher than the president at this point. <laughs> That's just how big of a person Oprah is. But um, let's go over some interesting facts about her. So one, her pet peeve is when people chew gum. Even Oprah has that one thing that gets under her skin. I hate chewing gum. It makes me sick just to think about it. When people chew loudly or smack it and pull it out of their mouth, that's the worst. Oprah, I get it. Me, I do not like when people smack, period. It makes me cringe. It just, it disturbs me to my uttermost soul. So, yes, Oprah, I do get what you're saying with that. Oprah was also a pageant girl. Now, this I did not know. Oprah won the Miss Black Tennessee beauty pageant at just 17 years old, leading to her first media job at a radio station. Now, that I did not know. I did not know Oprah was in pageant. So go, Oprah. Okay, girl. Her favorite book of all time is To Kill a Mockingbird. Over the years, Oprah has frequently praised the Harper Lee classic, crediting it with her love of a great story. I remember reading this book and then going to class and not being able to shut up about it, she has said. I read it in eighth or ninth grade, and I was trying to push the book off on other kids. So it makes sense to me that now I have a book club because I have been doing that since probably this book. That's actually one of my favorite books, too, other than The Great Gatsby. Um, It's To Kill a Mockingbird. I love the book. I love the, the movie. It's just, it's really good. Let's go over a couple more, or maybe a few more facts. Let's do three more. She was the first woman to own and produce her own show. September 8th, 1986 marked the beginning of Oprah's monumental Emmy-winning daytime talk show, The Oprah Winfrey Show. On air for 25 years, she became the first woman to both own and produce her own television show. And if you've never seen the Oprah Winfrey show, just take some time. It's got to be on YouTube or Hulu or somewhere. It's got to be somewhere. That show, I I, I like that show. Okay. Yeah. And I should watch it again. But actually, she actually has a podcast that highlights some of her... Um, episodes from the Oprah Winfrey show. And I know she has plenty of content. She has 25 years worth of content. So it's like 25 to 30 minutes, I believe. I haven't listened to an episode yet, but it's basically clips from her shows, clips from different segments of her shows. So make sure you check that out. It should be on all major platforms. She is afraid of balloons. Oh, wow. Wow. Yes, our very own Oprah has a pointed fear of balloons. 
officially known as glopophobia, if you were curious. I don't like balloons, and for my 40th birthday, my entire staff decided to surprise me. I come, and this is what she was saying, I come downstairs and the entire audience is filled with balloons. Literally, I'm stepping over balloons, having to walk through balloons. It reminds me of gunfire. <laughs> I did not know that she had a fear of balloons. You know, some people have fear of clowns. Other people has a fear of, of balloons. So that's okay, Oprah. Okay, and this is the last interesting fact that we'll talk about her. She is the first Black American female billionaire. According to Forbes, Oprah is the first and only African American female billionaire in the country, making her the richest Black woman in the U.S. with a net worth of $2.5 billion, more or less. So, okay, Oprah, I, I knew that she was a billionaire, but I did not know that she was the first. So, and if you know anything about Oprah, Oprah has made a lot of money. So this makes sense. So Oprah was definitely pivotal in Black history, specifically um, in the entertainment industry. And the Black community loves her. They love her. We love her. So thank you, Oprah, for your contributions. Okay, we are going to take a, a quick break. And then we are going to talk about some unsung heroes. Stay tuned. This podcast is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it is the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. F-R-E-E free. There's also creation tools that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more platforms. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. I actually use Anchor for this podcast and it has saved me a lot of time and energy because everything is consolidated in one place. It just makes it so much easier. So if you're interested in doing the same thing, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Once again, you can download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Okay, y'all, we are back. Let's go over some unsung heroes for our last episode of this series. The first one is Hiram Revels. Long before the civil rights movement picked up steam in the 1950s, Hiram Revels was laying the groundwork for what was to come. Revels, a minister and Civil War veteran, was the first Black man elected to the U.S. Senate, a position he chose to leave to serve as president of Alcorn Agricultural and Mechanical College. He continued to be a staunch advocate for the integration of American schools and equal rights for African American workers. Wow. So he was the first Black man elected to the U.S. Senate, which for all of my international listeners, the Senate is basically a um, a leg of Congress, and they are the ones who help to make laws for our country. So they are part of what we call the legislative branch, which, um, like I was saying, they help to create laws and rules for our country. Okay, so he was the first Black man to be in the Senate, which I did not know. Okay, 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 okay. So let's go to another one. Now, we probably heard of her before, but I I really think that she is one of those underrated um, heroes of Black history, and that is Shirley Chisholm. So she was a New York State Assembly member 
and was the first Black woman elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, as well as the first Black major party Black to run um, for president, which she did in 1972. She was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015, which we all know that the Presidential Medal of Freedom is a very prestigious award that you can get in the United States. Not too many people get that award. Another person who was an unsung hero in Black history is Branch Rickey. So he was a baseball player turned sports executive and became a pioneer in ending sports segregation when in 1945, he signed Jackie Robinson to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers, breaking Major League Baseball's long-standing race barrier. Wow. So he was pivotal in ending sports segregation, which, you know, you never really kind of, I've never really kind of um, thought about there being segregation in sports, but of course there is, um, or uh, of course there was, I should say. And for him to sign a black person, and it looks like he was um, a Caucasian man. So to sign a African, an African-American man to Major League Baseball to play for a Major League Baseball team was huge, huge. So thank God for him that helped to break that barrier. And I'm sure that broke the barrier for other sports as well. Um, okay, let, let's do a few more. Um, another one is LaVon Brown. So he was a Mississippi native and he served as a major force in the movement to integrate the South, participating in anti-segregation sit-ins before joining the SNCC. Getting involved in activism at an early age, Brown was arrested multiple times for his work. The first being at age 16 for his participation in a sit-in protest at a Walgreens lunch counter in Jackson, Mississippi in 1961. Wow. So I'm not sure if this Walgreens is the same as the Walgreens that we know today, which I believe is more popular in the United States. I don't know if my international listeners have a Walgreens around them. Um, but Walgreens now is basically a store that specializes in um, pharmacy items. So over-the-counter medications for the most part, but they've expanded to include groceries, food, photos, etc. So he, um, he, Mr. Brown planned a protest, a sit-in protest at a lunch counter in Walgreens. So maybe at the time, Walgreens served um, food as well. So this was in Jackson, Mississippi, which that don't surprise me that they were um, doing these protests in Mississippi because Mississippi is still having some issues, okay? Mississippi is... Ooh, Mississippi is a trip. Now, I'll just say that. Mississippi is just one of those states that it seems like it's still kind of living in the past, kind of slow. Living in the past, I, I'm i just not interested to go into to Mississippi. Do not judge me, guys. But, yeah, Mississippi is just one of those states that I try to avoid. Hopefully, anyone who's listening that's from Mississippi, don't be offended if there are some good points in Mississippi, please let me know so that I can entertain it. But from what I've heard, it's just not the best state to be in. <laughs> okay, let's do a couple more. So this next one is Nanny Helen Burroughs. Once denied a teaching job in Washington, D.C. for being too dark, Ms. Burroughs went on to create the National Training School for Women and Girls, a trade school for Black high school and college-aged girls in 1909. After her death in 1961, the school, which integrated themes of racial pride and community activism into its curriculums, was renamed in her honor in 1964. So that is interesting because that 
too dark notion has really crept up into modern society today where too dark is just not a thing now um I, I think it's gotten a little bit better but it's interesting to see how that got how that notion progressed throughout the years as to being too dark i remember um, because i am a darker african-american girl I remember telling my mom, who was lighter than me, that I wanted to be light like her. And of course, my mom was like, no, you're beautiful just the way that you are and tried to find me um, different, darker women who I could look up to. But remember, Lupita wasn't a thing. Viola Davis wasn't a thing. So I didn't really have too much too many people to look up to. The only dark skinned girls that there were that were kind of popular that I remember was India Ari. Shout out to India Ari. She um, is a um, singer slash songwriter. And then Kelly Rowland, you know, Kelly Rowland, Destiny's Child, etc. Other than that, it wasn't a thing. And even then, they weren't as popular as they probably should have been because of their darker skin, I believe. So to see that she was denied a teaching job for being too dark in D.C., it's kind of a, a trigger. So um, I'm glad she was able to move forward from that and create something that would help other girls who may have, go, may have gone through or probably in the future would have gone through the same situation that she did. Okay, let's do one more. This next one is Ruby Bridges. Now, Ruby Bridges, she's a little bit more popular. Um, there is a movie um, about her, and I can't think of the name. I can never think of, think of the names of, of these movies. But as soon as I think of it, um, what, what I'll do is I'll put it in the show notes. But it's a really good movie about Ruby Bridges. <laughs> In 1960, at just six years old, Ruby Bridges became the first black student to integrate an elementary school in the South. During her first year at William France Elementary School in New Orleans, Bridges and her mother were escorted by federal marshals every day due to the hateful and threat-fueled reactions of the school's students as well as their parents. Only one teacher at the school would accept Ruby as her student, and no other children attended class with the teacher and Ruby, who never missed a single day. Yes, there is a movie about that who that shows the whole entire process of what Ruby Bridges went through being a student in that school. And I will put the movie in the show notes once I find out what the name of it is. But that's all that I have for you guys today. I really hope you guys enjoyed this series, this episode. Make sure you send me an email just letting me know at mindofmillennials at gmail.com. Make sure to like our Facebook page, The Millennial Mind, and also our Instagram page, The underscore Millennial Mind. Um, the link is in the show notes. If you want to support this podcast, um, that will help me to keep this podcast going and to make it better. Also, I do have a blog. Um, make sure that you read those posts that I have up now, and there will be some future posts coming up in the next few weeks. And the website for that is christianfuller.com backslash blog. And that link will be in the show notes as well. Of course, I have a quote for you guys. I cannot leave this podcast episode or each podcast episode without a quote. Who doesn't like quotes? I love quotes. I know you do too. So this quote is from Oprah Winfrey. It says, every time you state what you want or believe, you're the first to hear it. It's a message to both you and others about what you think is possible. Don't put a ceiling on yourself. Yes, Oprah, yes. Well, once again, thank you guys for listening to this episode. And until next week, I will talk to you guys soon.